In this video, we're going to be taking a look at the all new Surface NUC 1, and this is a really interesting little product. It's not by Microsoft, like you might think with a name like Surface. It's by another company known as X Plus, and we've seen a few of their devices over the past few years, ranging from mini laptops to mini PCs. But as you can see here, we've got an ultra tiny Windows 11 tablet. In fact, it's got a seven inch display here. It's an IPS running at 60 Hertz. This also has 16 gigabytes of RAM, and out of the box, it comes with a 512 gigabyte M.2 SSD. Around back here, we do have this fold out kickstand, and they sent a few accessories over with it. But before we really get into it, I do want to mention that this video is sponsored by FlexiSpot. And I've personally been taking a look at these ergonomic standing desks for quite some time. I personally picked up the EN1 on Amazon during a Prime Day sale. And after spending about a week and a half with it, I actually reached out to FlexiSpot to see if they could send over a much larger desk. So they were kind enough to send over the E6. I use this for most of my unboxing videos and everything like that. The E6 is absolutely massive and it's got a real bamboo top. This thing has been a lifesaver when it comes to just having a much larger area to work in. So when they reached out again about their E2L L-shaped standing desk, I knew I had to get my hands on it. The adjustment panel is up here with memory presets and there's even safety features built in with this unit. So if it does kind of tug on a cord or bump something, it'll automatically stop going up or down depending on what the thing's doing at the time. Height adjustment is anywhere from 28 to 47.6 inches and it'll lift 220 pounds. This thing has been awesome and I'm gonna be adding another monitor at the very end. But uh, if you're interested in learning a little more, they do offer this in black or white. Obviously, I got the white version here. Assembly is pretty easy. The L-shaped version is a bit more complicated than just a regular desk, but it's well worth it if you need the space. And if you're interested in learning a little more, I'll leave links in the description. Along with the Surface NUC 1, they also sent over a little fold-out keyboard and folio case. So this does not attach to the tablet itself. It just kind of lays on the desk. Fold-out design, you can recharge it over USB Type-C. But one of the interesting things about the NUC 1 here is actually the I.O. selection they have. Up top, we've got a Gigabit Ethernet port and three full-size USB 3.2 ports. Over here on this side, full-size USB 2.0, a 3.5 millimeter audio jack, and our power button. And of course, on the other side, full-size HDMI and two USB Type-C ports. I was actually pretty impressed that we've got so many full-size USB ports on this unit. And when it comes to the overall specs here, it's not a super powerful system, but it is using the Intel N200 CPU. So we've got four cores, four threads, with a maximum clock up to 3.7 gigahertz, Built-in Intel UHD graphics with 32 execution units, and this will clock up to 750 megahertz. 16 gigabytes of LP DDR5 RAM running at 4800 megahertz. A single 2242 M.2 SSD, and it came with a 512 gigabyte drive, but you can upgrade to a two terabyte in this. We've got a seven inch IPS display with a resolution of 1280 by 800, running at 60 hertz and it's 16 by 10. Wi-Fi 6, Bluetooth 5.2, and on their website they state that it's got a 3400 milliamp hour battery and it comes pre-installed with Windows 11. Moving in here a bit closer to give you a look at everything, I've just plugged into the HDMI on the side to my game capture. As you can see, we've got that Intel N200, four cores, four threads. It's got a base clock of one gigahertz. It'll boost up to 3.8 on a single core. And when all four cores are maxed out, it does go up to 2.9. 16 gigs of LP DDR5 at 4800. And of course, the built in Intel UHD iGPU with 32 compute units. When it comes to these N chips from Intel, be it the N100, N150, or even the N200, they're usually lower wattage. But this does have a boost up to 15 watts. Uh, just on the CPU itself, I think we can do up to around 12, close to 13 actually in some cases. Once I put a load on the GPU, it'll do up to 15. So not too bad here. You can get some pretty good performance out of it for what we have. And if you wanted to use this as an everyday PC for web browsing, email checking, this N200 actually works out pretty well. We'll head over to YouTube and check out some YouTube video playback. The built-in screen only goes up to 800p, but through my game capture, I'm at 900 right now. And I wanted to see if we could do at least some 1080. I'm sure this N200 will actually. Turn stats for nerds on up in the top left hand corner. 
and throughout, I don't think we're going to drop any frames. Uh, even something like the N150 can do 4K 60 HDR all the way through without dropping a frame on YouTube, whether you want to use Chrome or the Edge browser like we have here. So obviously not the most powerful little system here, but I did want to run some benchmarks to give you a look at some CPU and GPU scores. And the first one we have here is Geekbench 6 at 15 watts with this N200, single core 1,231, multi-core 3,101. I also ran a GPU benchmark using 3 Mark. Here's Night Raid. On that Intel UHD iGPU, we scored 5,273. So it's not going to win any benchmark award, but I still wanted to test out some gaming on this machine and especially emulation because when it comes down to it, these lower end end chips from Intel actually handle emulation really well. With something like this, we're not going to be running Cyberpunk 2077, but there are indie games and older games that'll run quite well. Here's Hades 2. We're at 800p because that's the maximum resolution of the display. Medium settings. And overall, not too bad. Every once in a while, I do see a dip under 60, and I'm not exactly sure what that's about, but this little N200 does have more than enough power to run a game like this at full speed. And if I didn't have that frame counter on screen, I wouldn't know it went under 60. It's a really playable experience. Going back a bit here, we've got Dirt 3, 800p, medium. I personally love this game, and we can get over 70 FPS on average with this one at medium settings. And if you take a look at Afterburner, we're pulling around 10 watts in total from that CPU. So not too bad. I mean, it's not pulling a ton of energy, and I didn't think it would because we've got a lower end N200 from Intel here. I also wanted to test out Left 4 Dead 2, 800p, medium settings, and you know, with these older games, yeah, you can have a pretty good time with the N200 on this thing. Now, I'm having a hard time figuring out exactly who the Surface Nuck 1 is for, but uh, overall, so far, I mean, with older games, indie games, not too bad for a very low-end system. But the next thing I want to get into is some emulation. We're going to test out GameCube, Wii, and PS2. Here's some GameCube using the Dolphin emulator. We're at 720p, so we've got a little bit of upscale here. We're not running it at native. DirectX 11, and I also tested Vulkan, so with the Wii emulation, I'm using the Vulkan back in. DX11 and Vulkan on this chip do seem to perform about on par with each other. I didn't notice a significant drop in power usage going over to Vulkan from DX11. And for the most part, with these low-end chips, I usually just keep it with DirectX. But even with the Intel N100, I do see some pretty decent GameCube emulation. Next up, we've got Wii, still using the Dolphin emulator. 720p Tatsunoko versus Capcom, using Vulkan instead of DX11. And even while pulling off these special moves with lots of particle effects on screen, it does stay steady at 60 FPS. And the final thing I wanted to test here was some PS2 emulation using PCSX2. I did try 2x resolution, but it was a little too much. We were right there at around 55 FPS. So I dropped it down to 1.5x res and at 800p, not bad at all. DX11, and with this I didn't go over to Vulkan, we'd probably see around the same kind of performance. But yeah, I mean, it's running this game really well. And seeing that we can run GameCube, Wii, and PS2, the lower end stuff is also going to run at full speed. So if you want to do some Dreamcast, some Sega Saturn, and some PSP, it's going to work on this little tablet. Personally, I do love the idea of a tablet this size, especially with all the I.O. we have here. You can connect this to a larger display. I tested it with my game capture. You can run stuff at 1080. It looks really good connected over HDMI. But I do wish this was a bit thinner. Now, we've got that kickstand around back, which is a nice little touch, but it's kind of thick for what we've got here. Would be nice if it was about half the thickness it is right now. You can see it's kind of a chunky boy. But like I mentioned, I'm kind of having a hard time figuring out who exactly this is for. Now, if I had a fold-out keyboard, yeah, it would be a little more usable for a lot of people out there. But when it comes down to it, there's a ton of Android tablets on the market that you can pick up. They're much cheaper. And for most people out there, if you don't need the extra I.O. we have here, then you can get by just fine with an Android tablet. And you're going to get better battery life out of something like that also.
But either way, I figured I'd go ahead and show this off. I thought it was really interesting. Let me know in the comments below if you have a use case scenario for something like this. But that's going to wrap it up for this one. If you're interested in learning a little more, I'll leave links to the official website in the description. Like always, thanks for watching.